Father, we just uh, bring ourselves into full alignment again in time and for your word. And Lord, whatever in here you don't want, just help me just blow past. So only that which is of Jesus remains. Lord, let's just, we are still again and remember that you're God. You hold our lives in your hand. You know the number of hairs on our head. Some of it's not many, some it's more, but regardless, you are with us. Let that word be firmly grasped in all this. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so we're about to cross into a new month, right? We're in a time we're about to go into a countdown. So, you know, part of what we're just always doing, do you, can you tell what this is? Trees in a forest. Okay, there you go. Yeah, sometimes you can't see the forest for the... That's right, right? Sometimes we're so busy in the blur of life that you can't see it. Yeah, some of you are still trying to do it. Do you know the same thing is true with, with time, right? With time, a lot of times, you're such, we're all such in the blur of time and the things that are all demanding to happen at once that we don't see the forest for the trees. Okay, well, this one should be simple, right? So here's another one. Sometimes you cannot see the righteous one for the religion. Okay? Right? And this is, uh, you know, well-intended and praising, but sometimes, you know, we just get into a certain, I always do this. Part of Gail's word that you received in that testimony from Brazil is learning after 44 years of praying for people to do it differently. And it's just amazing how God keeps setting these time sets so that we will shift. So the reason we do, for instance, those of you who pay rent or pay a mortgage, when is it typically due? First of the month, right? Why is it not due every 30 days? Well, yeah. Well, no, they, they because they, they, they still get the same paint, right? In a year, they get... But, see, it's far easier for you to go first of the month, right? A month is a cycle that you understand, and it causes you to reset. Oh, yeah, this bill's due that, right? Maybe it's on the fifth of the month, but it helps you do that. And so we do that in our lives, and God does the same thing in time. Okay, new month, stop. And you check in and go, okay, what, what's going on? What do I need to pay attention to? So we do that. And we're in this time now, we're, we're, we're now throttling into the end of, of this biblical calendar. And God said in Leviticus, these are my appointed times, right? And he gives out seven, but the three big ones are Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles. You got this, right? Now, sometimes I put those on a straight line, but it's important to see it in a cycle because at each one of these places, there's a transaction time of God saying, I need you to remember something and click in. And of course, then I like to overlay it. Oh, by the way, we're here. See where that is? We're coming around the corner. We've come through a long, dry, hot summer. First month was Passover, third month, Pentecost. Tabernacle is going to come up on the seventh month. We're now just crossing into the sixth biblical month called Elul. Okay, E-L-U-L, -L, if it's designated. And so we could also equate this with salvation, saturation, and sanctification, right? Because salvation, Passover, right? Cross and resurrection, Pentecost equates for us with what? Holy Spirit coming. So then you're saturated, right? I'm kind of getting past the being spirit-filled, because I think you are. It's just a matter how much the Spirit has of you. Spirit can't be divided up into smaller parts. He's there. It's just access, right? And then the sanctification, because it goes into yet another level. And I think these three steps, and God keeps us cycling around, is something God is desperate for the church to reclaim, because Israel got it. And we've been grafted into that root. We don't have to follow the legalism, but there's, there's structure here that reminds us. So I always use the marriage thing of leave, cleave, and become one, right? Leaving is Egypt. You're leaving the sin, you're getting free from it. Cleaving is the marriage vows where it's Sinai. It's that the spirit is given to us as that token, that promise ring. And then the becoming one is God dwelling in the midst of his people, right? That level of intimacy. And so each year God wants us to come back around on that, back around on that, back around on that again. And right in the midst of this, oh, again, we're there. What I want you to see, if you watch this, it's just suddenly getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter because we're coming into a place and it feels a little bit like this tunnel. There's a light down there, but you're in a long, dark shaft. If you keep staring at it, it gets kind of closer and it gets bigger and 
Maybe the train is coming. No, it's, it's you coming out of it. Okay. So we're in a time right now that the clock is getting ticked over something called Teshuvah. And it's a time of soul searching. Okay. Because we're heading now to tabernacles. But before we get there, we're going to hit the holiest day of the year per the biblical calendar, which is interesting. Do you know when that is? Yom Kippur, which means what? Covering. But what do you know it as? Day of atonement. Okay? And it's fascinating because the church now, there's, there, Christ does cover that, but we simply sort of wrap it into what we call Easter, right? And that whole thing. And then we miss this six-month mark where Passover is about getting free from the sin, but atonement and tabernacles is about being able to dwell with a God that's holy in your midst. It's one thing to come out of Egypt. It's another to understand just how holy, how other he is. Okay, and so we get very comfortable with just being sort of out of sin, and we don't get the second, the next part of it. Do you understand? Hello? Okay. <laughs> Have to check. Smaller group tonight because of the thing. So this is a time of Teshiva, a return, right? It's just a dog looking back, by the way, his shadow. But I liked it enough. Teshuvah, return. Okay? It has the word repentance connects in with it a lot, but sometimes repentance gets a very, I don't know, it gets a lot of other religious and kind of beat yourself up tone to it. I want you just to understand there's areas in all of us where we need to turn back again to God. Think of the prodigal being out there, right? Finally desperate enough to eat the food for the pig, but when he turns towards home, right? It's just that turning back. He doesn't have his act wired together. He hasn't even talked to the father, but he's turned. He's done that return. And so the fall appointed times that we're going to come into are trumpets and atonement and tabernacles. Boom, boom, boom. And it's a wake up call. Then it's getting at one through the sacrifice of the scapegoat and the goat that's going to be sprinkled on the altar, right? We'll get into that later. But for if you were a Jew in Jesus' time, your focus now shifts completely towards that day of atonement and the big, big deal that's coming up then about the goats. Okay? And so that going through that tunnel is getting towards that, but you've got to go through that gavel. Making sense? I'm going quickly through this because I want to... Some of you have followed this before, and I don't want to drag out too long. So in the sixth month, the month of Elul and the tribe of Gad, Elul is used, or six months, six times in scriptures. You can just do your concordance sometime and see where they are. We'll, we'll touch on those. There's 87 references to the tribe of Gad. Gad is the sixth tribe when they're reordered around the tabernacle. That's why we look at them, and I'm not even going to touch on them tonight. But the key events are this is the third of 40 days when Moses is before the presence of God. Okay, because we know exactly when Pentecost happens, because we know all these things that happen, and we know he's up for 40 days, he's down for 40 days because of something happening, and then he's back up, and we're in that third round of time, and then it's a transition from what happened in the past two months. So we'll look at that and a countdown. I'm just flying through this, aren't I? Sorry. Here's what I want you to get. We're in a 40-day countdown now towards the Day of Atonement. And I just wish that we hadn't lost touch of that so much with the church. What's interesting is for the Jews, they rightly put these 40 days of getting turned towards God where it's supposed to be, which is before Atonement, not before Passover. I don't know exactly how the church got 40 days of Lent thrown out there in front of that. But that's about getting your sin forgiven, which is right. But this is now about continuing to abide with a holy God. And woe of me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. And so we put a lot of focus in on that first coming free from sin, and so we get our card punched, our salvation card, and then we just live however the hell we want. And God's like, you know what? Ain't going to work. There's a need. The blood has been provided for, but there's a time when you need to remember this and turn towards me. So I put this because I you kind of think of it as three rounds that Moses is doing, three 40-day times. So Pentecost, Pentecost happens there. The word of the Lord comes, rumbles on top of the mountain, right? And the, the Ten Commandments are released, but the people say, what? 
Ah, oh, they freak out. We can't hear. No, we don't have them talk to us anymore. You go and talk to them. So Moses goes up for 40 days. And while he's there, right, they get tired of waiting. Maybe he's just a crispy critter now. And so they go and revert in the golden calf. So God has sends Moses down. And of course, literally there is hell to pay, right, for that. But Moses, and if you read in Deuteronomy 9, 9 and Deuteronomy 9, 19, then the second 40 days, he's in intercession. He didn't eat or drink for 40 days, pleading before the Lord not to take Israel out. And he does that, and now he goes for a second 40 days when God calls him up, and I just call it round three, because it's like he's gone three big rounds, right, with God. And if you look at the conversation back and forth, and that occurs over in Deuteronomy 10.10 10 is when you see about that second, that third set of 40 days. And this connects over into Genesis 33 and 34, a conversation between Moses and God. And so atonement's going to come right at the end of that. So where we are right now is right there. We're right at the cusp of that 40 days when Moses is about to re-enter with two tablets according to God's commandment. And then a part of that thing, he's going to go, now God, show me your glory which is really amazing because it's right before atonement because Moses will come down on the Day of Atonement for rabbinical teaching. And I think it's, it's accurate when you do the math. But he's also going to come down, what? Having seen part of God, so what's going to be happening? The glory of God is on his. And the atonement is about the glory being able to abide with people, with us in our midst. So the tabernacle is a celebration of that. It's a getting into the Holy of Holies. So, from Moses, David, can you read this? <clears throat> Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you, remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So he went through this business of the Lord twice. Yeah, this is the time, this is the time now, right, when he goes up through it again and says, this is when he's putting God to the mat though, right? This, like I said, there's a bit of a wrestling match back and forth. But I want you to see, for those of you who are intercessors in this time, the prayer that Moses releases, right? He's reminding the Lord, Lord, these are your people. Ergo, one of the things we can't do is bear the burden, right? Moses says, these are your people, okay? These are your people, God. There's a cry out now, I think, for the church, and where is the church going to be, and how much of the church is going to simply be set aside because it's unwilling to make changes? And where will God do restoration? Will revival break out in the church or not? Some maybe, some probably not at all. Because just too set. Remember, the can't see the righteous one for all the religion. But this encouragement, remember that this nation is your people. This nation is your people. And then this, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Did you breathe that in? So hear this from the Lord. Just close your eyes. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. You receive that? Mm -hmm. This is a word released in time during this 40 days. I want you to just be able to go back, right? Part of which, when God has time stamped certain scriptures, is just feel like God set it there because there's something he needs me to know about that. And it has to do with the intimacy of the Lord. This is a time in the month of Elul when the rabbinical tradition will teach a parable about the king in the field. Okay, That the king is in the field. He's often in the palace, but now he's in the field. There's not a great biblical connect time-wise for that, just so you know. There's other biblical scriptures that, that do stuff, but there's not the direct connect. But in ones like this, you have that sense of that intimacy. My presence will go with you. Ergo, I'm in the field with you. Right? I'm not distant and aloof here. Carolyn, did you read this? Then Moses said to him, If your presence do not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? 
What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Is this a resonant question for the church now? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? If there is not that tangible presence, I am hungry for the glory of God just to, to right? Those of you, hey, how many of you like, uh, were able to, some of you were, some of you were not, the all day teaching with, with Ruthie? Yeah, I mean, it was just Ruthie and Billy Joe. And uh, Ruthie just did an amazing job. And part of that, I think she's convincing me that my, my wiring is as a mercy. And what that means is there's a deep passion at the, the one David and uh, Joshua are the two that sort of epitomize that. But the hunger is to, to get the, the veil open from the Holy of Holies to the people. That's always just wanting people to connect the dots into that. And we've clearly got to find again repent again, return again, so that the glory will remain where God's people are. So people come up and go, wow, there is something different. We're not getting people stopping up in grocery stores saying, okay, you're just so different. There's something so amazing. What is that? I gotta have that. Okay, Caroline. So the Lord said to me, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me <laughs> you know and we'll maybe in this month go through that a time because as the Lord says okay I, we're going to work this out I'm going to put you on a, on a rock and a cliff I'm going to hide you and then I'm going to declare my name and pass by with my goodness mm -hmm. and in his name then are these attributes and if you haven't been back in there in, in uh, Exodus 34 you need to go there and just hang out there and be encouraged. But I, I, I just love the boldness of Moses. Now show me your glory. Come on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Okay, Nehemiah, or Haggai rather, is another one. On the first day of the sixth month of the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. It's just, this is a word that God tags to the sixth month, okay? Six in the Hebrew is a vav, right? A vav is a connector, okay? That's the Hebrew letter that means six. Six is also aligned with what? With man and woman, with Adam, okay? And so that sense about give careful thought to your ways, lacking in some. So ponder, don't just keep running. This is again, everything gets to be a blur and God goes, stop. Think about what you're doing. And particularly now as we get towards the Day of Atonement, I'm going to stir up some stuff at the very end here. I'm going to keep going because I, I don't want this to get too in-depth, but there's more here in Haggai about restoring what God has set in place. He said, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord? Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. God calls the body up short, saying, okay. And if we're wondering about the parallel, go to Revelation 3, right? Get it back in order. I will come and take the lampstand out from amongst you, right? The word to the churches in Revelation. You know what I'm talking about? This isn't just God talking to the Israelites. Right? There's a response out of this rebuttal from the Lord. Then Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. And then again, I want you to hear this message. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the people, Lord, a message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. You get again about the king in the field? You see, I am with you. That, that's being tagged again in this very time. There's a reminder about the presence of God in our midst. There's this, the month Elul, is, that is the Hebrew letters for it. Aleph, Lamed, Bad, and Lamed. 
those are the first letters of the scripture that says, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. There is again this intimacy about I am with you in this time. In a sixth month, in a time to give careful thought, you've got to give careful thought because I am with you. And we see once again the cycle, it's coming back around to becoming one, right? Leave, cleave, becoming one. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. There's a restoration of the intimacy there, but it's to a very holy God. And I love this phrase. I don't remember who ever said it, but we've grown far too familiar with a God we don't even know. Mm-hmm. I am personally in a time of tremendous breaking where God is breaking me down. <laughs> it's a really good way. And so I'm very aware of that, and that comes of, of seeing the place of God, the person of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God, and my frailty, right? And and just okay. And getting okay with the fact that he is both massive and intimate. Way beyond the stars, and yet somehow just right here in that still small voice. And it's the tension of, again, the grace and truth, right? Where those two ends of the electrical wire, the hot lead and the ground, and it's the same way of that intimate presence and yet his is all presence and you have to hold both to get the truth right mm-hmm. we always tend to want to just hold one end of the wire well he's very intimate he's my buddy he's just you know and we get kind of a little bit loose or oh he's god who am i right and we can't figure out how to do it and god says no you got to bring hold of both ends of that wire and we'll let that current go through you couple of references here. Again, the sixth month, there's sort of a danger and in intimacy, fire and friendship in Ezekiel's sixth year. In the sixth month, on the fifth day, when I was sitting in my house and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign God came upon me. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man from what appeared to be his waist down. He was like fire. And from there up, his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. So Ezekiel has this encounter Right? With what many will say were pre-incarnate Jesus with the angel of the Lord. And then here, Haggai, on the first day of the word of the month, the word of the Lord came to the people. I am with you. We covered that. So Teshiva returned for this is where we, we look at this month of mercy and forgiveness, a time to be restored in prayer, in study. Charity is part of that because you're getting your accounts in order before it goes before a holy God. Gail, would you read this out loud? <clears throat> Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. This is a time to make sure that we've got alignment properly. Something out of order, then get it set straight. So here's something that'll be a little bit, this is interesting. See, part of what I do is I look at a lot of different sources on this area, and I also will look at at some of the rabbinical writings and teachings from the rabbis. Not because there's not going to be problems, but sometimes they know stuff better about the word than we do, right? Because they've been living with it longer. And sometimes if I want a better understanding of moving towards the Day of Atonement, okay, at one month for me, and sometimes I'll do that. And I was reading this about how seriously they take the time when the trumpet sounds, Yom Terah, which is on the first of Tishri, it's a wake-up call. All you have to do is hear the sound of the shofar. It blows out. It's a wake-up call. There's 10 days and then the Day of Atonement comes. And the question is whether your name's gonna be written in the Book of Life or not for the following year. They mean it quite literally, like whether or not you're gonna live next year or not. And so this whole time now, Teshuvah returning, is to get yourself in order in preparation to go before God. So here's a rather bizarre thought I just want you to play with. God loves you. You've given your life to him, correct? Through Jesus Christ, by the blood of the Lamb, you have been bought. Your life is no longer yours. Your days have been numbered. But there's times when God said to a king, get your house in order. Remember this? Okay. 
and you got some extra time. So let's say you're not sure. All right, how many of you know if you're going to live or die next year? Okay. There was a 15-year-old on a bus this week. Girl in Lowndes High School, right? Very, very sad. And, and was hit by the semi. And suddenly, she's not here. And by God's grace, she's before the king's face now in the robe of righteousness. So the question is whether you would still be on the earth. So let's say October 3rd, by the way, is when that's coming around. That's, that's Rosh Hashanah. I should actually have rolled it seven days later. But So ignore the date right now. But on October 10th, say, you have an appointment with God. And in that time, it's a time in which you petition to live another year on the earth. And so it's not certain if your petition will be granted or not. Now, you're okay, because if not, you're going to get to go to heaven. So you may not even want a petition. <laughs> God, just take me now, please. Get me out of here, right? But let's we'll just say, see, we, we take so many, we get in the blur of things. We just take every next day for granted, don't you? Come on. I do. I'm thinking out five years, 10 years, 25 years, and worried about having money for retirement. I've not been promised tomorrow yet. Okay? <laughs> Only that he has my life, my days have been numbered, I'm with him. But let's say that at that time, what is the plan that you're going to present to God for the coming year? God, I think I need to be around this next year. Yeah, why? There's only so much food and oxygen out there, what are you going to do? Besides, you wore out three of my best angels last year. They're exhausted. Why would you ask to remain? Does this seem totally weird? Are you, you here? Okay. See, when the Jews come before in Teshuvah, they understand this is... They, they don't come with an assumption that their name's been written for next year. There's some real concern about getting things right. And they can get, there's a danger of legalism in a lot of that, right? But they want to make sure they've set things in order. Oops, let me move this forward. And what do you hope to accomplish specifically? So here's my encouragement to you. Gail talked about in her word testimony this, this blood covenant and writing some things down. I want you to walk into the day, towards the Day of Atonement, with some sort of plan, going, God, here's what I'd really love to see happen. I think you still want me here because I still need to, somebody needs to keep an eye on David. Right? Somebody has to make sure Gail doesn't go off the rails. Yeah. That's why most of you are here for me. Make sure Johnson doesn't go. But what, I'm serious about this. What if you were to say, Lord, here's another year. I don't want to take it for granted. I want to make the great best use of it. Here's what I think needs to shift for me. And you submit that to the Lord. See, this is the seriousness of tissue, of returning again, of coming through that long, dark channel out to the brilliant light, which is his glory, which is his presence. But he's a holy God in our midst. And frankly, I think the world might be better off if God took at least half, if not 80% of those who say that they are Christians and took them off the face of the earth. Right? Well, no, because... I'm not going to say that. You're not going to say I know, I know. But I mean, and it's sometimes right. Here's, here's a story. I don't know if it's true. Alexander the Great, you know who he was, right? They brought to him a young soldier who had fallen asleep on duty. And you know what the penalty for that was? Yeah. Death. That's right. You know the story? So they bring him forward, and he's, Alexander the Great's talking to him. He says, what is your name? He says, Alexander. He says, what? What is your name? Alexander. One more time, what is your name? Alexander. And he said, then either change your name or change your behavior.
right? If we're going to call and say we're on the follower of Jesus, you either change your name or change your behavior. On the other, okay. This is something that just struck me. We had good friends here. I'm going to wrap up with this. Um, a guy that that was when I graduated from college, I served for three years in a church as a youth pastor. He was a junior in high school. And um, we've stayed connected all these years. That was back in 1980. And he came through this last week with his wife of 20, 30 years, 27 years. And uh, they were here to see their eldest, their youngest son pinned um, over to Fort Benning as a ranger. And so we got to be with them. And we were talking because her, her family had immigrated from the Philippines. And we were talking about our dad and just the hard time he had and who he was prior to coming over and who he became. And she used this phrase, he was humbled by God, but crushed by man. And I just, when she said it, I went, whoa. She goes, you know, I've never said that before. And she just, I said, well, say it again. <laughs> so she said it again, and I was kind of pondering it. And I got thinking, you know what? I, I don't think that's quite right. I think there really is a choice here in the midst of this because how many of you have been crushed by man? Okay. See, the fact of the matter is, I think in all of these, there's a choice for the most part. I think things happen to us where someone betrays us, someone lets us down, someone speaks some harm, all sorts of things. And it could be man or woman, right? Don't get caught on the on the, the male of man, but see men and women. But I think then there's a decision whether or not we're humbled at which point we come out of that into strength or whether we're crushed at which point we go into despair. Do you get that? I think it's humbled by God or crushed by man. Paul says we're pressed but not crushed. Persecuted but not abandoned. So the question comes in the midst of this, in Teshuvah, and particularly in people where you felt like they've crushed you, how are you going to release them? The Jews get that they can't ask for forgiveness from the Holy God until they have forgiven others. Jesus repeated it many, many a time, right? It's in the Lord's Prayer. But somehow we miss it. So, warning, crush zone. So Teshuvah, to return. It's a preparatory month. You set things right. It's a month of returning and mercy and forgiveness of the Lord because each time we turn into him, there's more and more of his grace. And there is this phrase, I am my beloved's and he is mine. There's the connection, but the fierceness of who is there because the king is in the field. You got it? I'm going to just play.
This is my heart and why this video just resonates for me here now, right? Is because this is in the tabernacle. It's understanding that the end goal is to be in the Holy of Holies. And too often we've just stopped out, you know, at the, at the altar back there. And God's like, no, I want, there's more, right? Come deeper, come deeper, come deeper. Don't just come away, come deeper. Come deeper into me. And there's just a... I am, here's where I've come to the conclusion. Most of us say, I trust in God. But what we really mean is I trust in what God will do. And I'm going to like it. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Just very candid. This is where I've had to come that my trust has been, instead of in where God's been so dealing with me, is that I'm just having to go, I trust in you. I don't know what that's going to be. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I trust in you to do these things. I'm having to get away from that. No, you've got to be enough. This is just, it's got to be enough with you because then whatever happens hits the fan doesn't. Because I was thinking about this phrase, I am sure of this, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, right? That verse is very important in this month for Jews. But I want you to answer this question. When did Stephen see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? 
When? Yeah. In the middle of that, when the heavens open up, and Jesus is standing. <laughs> and there is so much grace flowing on Stephen. In the midst of his bones being broken, and his ribs, and, and everything else, that he, he cries out, don't, don't hold this against him. I mean, goodness. See, too often we've gotten the goodness equated in certain ways, and I think God's like going, am I enough for you, Stephen, or not? <laughs> you know, are you really going to trust in me or going to trust in what you think I'm going to do? And I'm having to get, no, it's, it's you, it's you, it's you. So I feel this just compelling being drawn into that holy of holies, knowing that's a dangerous place, right? I was working with one of our allies about the names of God. And you know, the Hebrews won't even say what we call Yahweh, right? Those four letters. They'll just substitute Adonai, because only the high priest could say them once a year and ten times because they're so concerned about taking the name of the Lord God in vain. And we're so casual about everything, you know? Now, I don't want to be that uptight. I don't think God's a legalist. But it just, it's just like the holiness of God. He's both that intimate, but it's dangerous. There's fire back there. And it's going to burn off the impurities. Father, I pray for all of us. Teshuvah that we would return in this countdown now to the Day of Atonement. Father, there's not a legalism here. We know that we are in Christ Jesus. He is our complete covering. He has broken through to the Holy of Holies, but so often we lag outside because of deception and dishonesty. Deception of the enemy, dishonesty of ourselves with ourselves and with you, of just saying, I'm a mess, but I'm your mess. Lord, I pray that we would all, in this month, just shift. Move with expectation. You are, you are indeed present with us. And you will give us rest. But Lord, help us deal with the clutter and the chaos that's keeping us from connecting deeply to you. And we just seal up this word now that it will loose in us greater joy and encouragement. In the name of Jesus. Amen.